Now, we're talking about Richard Allen, the guy that took in and did the Delphi murders. He, he got transferred, what, there to Westville when? Like Thursday. Last okay. Thursday. Okay. So you know some people that take care of him or feed him and stuff? You're not recording this shit, are you? No. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but yeah. But anyways, yeah. All right. Yeah, they were actually, this dude was, this is the, they told him the other day, and they said, hey, clean up, we need you to clean out this observation cell. Clean it out really good. And then he was like, what's going on? Like, man, there's something, something's up. Like, this is, everybody's acting all weird. So he cleaned out, yeah, he scrubbed this observation room. It's a suicide room. It's on camera. Man. Like 30 officers come in, like like state police, the sheriffs, all of them, and they brought in him. They brought him, Richard Allen, in there in an observation cell. No and, shit. Yeah, so he's on suicide watch. He's on camera. And they are not allowed to bring him food or nothing. The CO's bring him the food, but they walk by him. And he's basically been asleep for three days. He won't, he don't do nothing. He just, he sleeps. And everybody on the ranges are yelling at him, saying, you're not safe anywhere, bitch. We're, we're going to kill your ass. And just, they're just hollering at him 24-7. No shit. And, yeah, and he's just, he's laying there acting like he's sleeping the whole time since he's been here for like three days. Dang. You got to provide me with updates, bro, on this guy. I will. That's why I just, yeah, I just went and asked dude that, yeah, he's actually the one that cleaned out the observation cell. That's what he called it, an observation cell. And the sergeant when it was like, clean this out. And he's like, what's what's going on? Like, you like, and the sergeant was like, I'll tell you in a minute. And then they're like, you know that fucking dude that killed the Delphi girls? Like, yeah, they're bringing him in here. Like, they said they can't, they don't have anywhere in the state, anywhere they can keep him safe. I bet not. Mom said that the... The judge was like, look, I'm ordering him to be sent to Indiana Department of Corrections and, like, withdrew from the case. Yeah, the judge is scared, man, because the judge is worried that they're going to be putting pictures of his family and stuff like that on the news and on TV. And the judge even said that his staff can't handle this case. And, like, yeah, I could see this definitely being transferred. Hey, I did, but they called in a bit. They said they might have a judge. I did see that. So I want to know how they found out of Tim finally. Well, bro, what I know, and this is for me, like, keeping an eye on social media and filtering through the crap and not the crap, you know. But, so... I guess they served a search warrant on his home almost two weeks to the day of them detaining him. And I heard that the way they got the search warrant was they said that one of the neighbors had something stolen and it was buried in his yard. And that's how they were able to get the search warrant for his place. And so, what they find? Um, from what I've seen on social media from the neighbor that was there watching all day long, the neighbor said that the cops rolled in at about noon and then they had Richard Allen standing out in his driveway for a couple hours and then Richard Allen's wife pulled up in her minivan and Richard Allen got into the minivan and sat in the passenger seat with the minivan door open and then uh, a couple hours after that I guess uh, it was seen that the sheriff of Delphi showed up with some piece of paper and went and showed it to Richard Allen 
And after that, uh, they went ahead and put his Richard Allen's vehicle, not the minivan, but his vehicle, they put it on a flatbed tow truck and towed it away. And they searched the house and they dug in the backyard in two different spots that were little burn piles. And then it was it was getting dark, but the neighbor was watching with binoculars and seeing them carry out a shoebox, uh, two different dark cloth items, and a Macy bag. And I think maybe one other thing, but I'm not for certain about that. So, but I also heard on social media that they had been watching Richard Allen and he had recently burnt something in his backyard. So this is what I believe most might have happened. That's all speculation, but still, this is kind of what I think. So, hello? Yeah, I'm here. Alright, so, you know who this Keegan Klein character is? Who? Keegan Klein? Yeah. Alright, so I think that guy, he was, um, soliciting minors online and I think his dad was possibly also involved Tony Klein and I think Tony Klein and Richard Allen knew each other because Richard Allen used to live in Peru close to Keegan Klein and his dad Tony Klein and Tony Klein and Richard Allen are about the same age. So, I think they knew each other from there, and uh, they went, the, they, you know, like Keegan Klein, the son, was like, hey, I've got these girls here, and because on Keegan Klein's phone, the day the girls went missing, he did a search for the Marathon gas station in Delphi. So I think he went to Delphi and either gave that phone to Richard Allen or sold it to him, or he was then either complicit with what happened with the girls, one or the other. I don't, yeah, I'm lost. Uh, what phone? I don't know. What, anyway, yeah, okay. The phone now. Uh, the phone that Keegan Klein was using to talk to the girls on the fake Snapchat account. Okay, I don't, yeah, I don't know nothing about that. Yeah, no, Keegan Klein, he had made up a fake Snapchat account and was talking to the girls on that fake Snapchat account. Well, he had talked to the girls the day that they went missing he was one of, he was like the last one to talk to him on that Snapchat account. So, I think that maybe Keegan Klein might have drove that phone to Marathon gas station and been and like, oh, I'm going to sell this other pedophile guy this fucking phone. Because he won't, you know, it has some little girl, because it, ha it has little girl contact information on it and stuff like that. Cause they think it's kind of like yeah, but I'm saying like, how did this dude live in the fucking Delphi for fucking six years under their and they didn't even like what everybody doesn't understand, man, is how did this guy, you know, because there's pictures of him, bro, up there at JP Bar. I seen him with him with the sketch of him in the background. Yeah. And, like, I thought, like, three days after it happened, he turned himself into the fucking yeah. hospital and shit, too. 
So how, people are like, how did his wife not know? And you know, I guarantee all that. she knows. Well, yeah, and then also it was, you know, some people might think are thinking now possibly maybe it was his wife that actually tipped the police off. Yeah, that's what I was wondering if his wife's the one that did it. But I think them off. I think this Keegan Klein character finally ratted Richard Allen out. I think because they searched the Wabash River just like two months ago, and right around that time, there was an order to pull Keegan Klein out of the Miami County Jail and take him into Indiana State Police custody so that he could make a deal with them and stuff. Because he was doing, yeah, he was doing court to, like, he was due for a jury trial and stuff in September. So, they, a lot of people think that this Keegan Klein, because he's facing, like, 30 different child porn charges, he made a deal with them finally and told them who he sold that phone to. I mean, I just, I don't know, I'm lost here. I'm just, I mean, I'm just saying, like, if this, these girls are walking along the trail and they dude killed them down there, like, what's that got to do with somebody talking to them on the phone? And, All right, and, well, how I about mean, this? What about if I set up a fake Snapchat account and I called Shannon Moyer up and Shannon Moyer thought he was getting ready to go meet Jennifer Aniston, but really it's the Grim Reaper at the bridge. Okay, nobody say anything about them meeting up with anybody. No, because that's, not, that's all speculation. That's why. But that's what they think. That, that's why the girls went to the bridge. The reason the girls went to that bridge, they believe, is because they communicated with Keegan Klein on that fake Snapchat account, and they thought they were going there to meet this guy by the name of Anthony Schatz, who's a, like a model, like a 19-year-old model, when really it's this big fat slobby dude. And they think that, I think that his dad, Tony Klein, because he knew Richard Allen, I think, I think all three of them are possibly involved. I think if there was that many people involved, then, then somebody would have already been caught. Well, they've got two of them. They've got Keegan Klein and they got Richard Allen. What they charged Keegan Klein with? 30-some different counts of fucking child porn. They got him. Yeah, from... but I'm saying what about the Delphi murders, though? Nope. What they are they charging him with on there? Nothing. Okay, that's, yeah. So it's all speculation. It's all speculation from there. That's why they got the probable cause affidavit sealed, and they're not letting anybody see that. There's a hearing, I think. You November. have one minute remaining. There's a hearing, I think, November 22nd, uh, to talk about if they have the if they're going to keep that probable cause affidavit sealed or not. Yeah, they need to quit being so secretive with everything. They let my orders know what the fuck they got going on. Well, that, yeah. I, I agree. I mean, we've waited long enough. Yeah. Anyways, I'm going to hop off here. It's about, that, it's about to hang up. You know, Make sure you order that magazine. I will, man. Especially when you got Delphi, or family that lives in Delphi, you know. Say what? I said, especially when you have family that lives in Delphi. Yeah, yeah. That's just, but... Okay, so let's take a look at some of the items reportedly recovered from the Allen property during the police search. Now, for this information, we're using a post from the Web Sleuths Forum, which has basically combined the information from Barbara McDonald and the neighbour who resides two doors up from the Allen residence. And it states the following. The search took place on October the 13th, commenced just before noon and went on for 12 hours. Law enforcement arrived in unmarked vehicles and clothing. Law enforcement asked Richard and wife to exit the house.
Richard stood in the driveway for several hours and also sat in the car with his wife for several hours. At some point, the neighbour said the wife left. Plenty of law enforcement just stood around for the first part of the day. As it was getting dark, Chief Deputy Liggett arrived with a piece of paper in hand. He handed that paper to Richard. Immediately, a tow truck arrived to take Richard Allen's car away. At this point, some law enforcement entered the house and some entered the backyard. They started searching the shed and taking pictures. Okay, so I'm just going to cut in here very briefly. A lot of the talk which emanated from this initial house search and the arrest of Richard Allen, the subsequent arrest of Richard Allen, a lot of that sort of early talk was, did his wife tip in Richard Allen? Was his wife the person who had contacted law enforcement? We had that side of the story. And then we also had a more bizarre one. The fact that Richard Allen had actually stole some tools or stole something from his neighbour. The neighbour had contacted law enforcement and that is basically what had led to the search of the Allen property. Now, why I don't put much stock in either of those ideas is for one, we have this wife who spends multiple hours in the car with Richard Allen. We've had a letter which has since been made public regarding Richard Allen looking for a solicitor or a lawyer. And that mentions his wife in a very favourable light. So I certainly don't think it's his wife that has come forward to tip him in to law enforcement. And then we look at the other angle regarding the neighbour, the stolen tools or whatever it is, the lawnmower, the wrench, whatever it is that this uh, Richard Allen has supposedly stolen from a neighbour. I, I just can't buy into that for one second either. Because someone who has done such a good job of concealing himself for five years is hardly going to draw attention to himself by stealing a socket wrench from his neighbour's garage. I just don't think that is a, is a feasible possibility. So let's continue on with this post here. Law enforcement were using a device like a metal detector or sonar around the shed and in the flower bed. They did not dig in the flower bed, but did dig up two tiny spots near the shed. Law enforcement started bringing items out from the house. Neighbours said one law enforcement officer came out with what appeared to be two large bundles of dark coloured cloth. Could not be sure it was clothes, only that it was definitely cloth. Okay, so let's just cut in again here very briefly. Now they talk about two large dark bundles of cloth being taken from the house. And I've seen quite a lot of talk online about this. You know, is this the jacket? Is this the jacket that this individual was wearing crossing the bridge? Um, and really, you know, it's just pure speculation, isn't it? You know, it's really impossible to tell exactly what this could be. And I think it's really worth bearing in mind that when they conduct these house searches, this is to take away any evidence that may be important. You know, any sort of media, electronical devices, clothing, maybe some rags with some odd staining on. Anything that they deem of importance is going to be removed and tested um, from that property. So... Yes, we have two large dark bundles of cloth. I mean, that could be literally anything. It could be, as I said earlier, just a bit of rag with a, an odd bit of staining on. It could be clothing in general. Also bear in mind that we're, we're taking an account here from a neighbour who is some distance away. Anyway, let's continue on with this post. Law enforcement also brought out a Macy shopping bag, a shoebox and a small stack of books. Said they were thin books, not thick like encyclopedia books. The neighbour said they were starting to get concerned and placed a call to the Chief Deputy Liggett to ask what was going on. And all that Liggett told them was to, quote, stay vigilant, especially with your wife and daughters. This unsettled them. The day after the search, Richard went to work. The neighbour states he saw him in store and felt Richard was continuing as if nothing happened. Neighbour said they lived life as normal till October 26th when Richard was detained. From October 26th, the neighbours have not seen anyone at the house. They have not seen the wife since he was detained. House has remained empty since October 26th. The neighbours said they were a normal family. They did not have visitors, no parties, etc. They were very quiet. Okay, so again there, there's mention of this house search taking place. Richard Allen then going to work the next day. This is someone who's keeping up appearances, as they say in this country. Someone who's, you know, trying to act normal. This isn't someone who's going to be drawing unnecessary attention to himself. So this talk of, oh, he stole something from a neighbour, or he had a dispute with a neighbour, he was caught on some camera stealing something and the police turned up. No, I just simply do not believe that. The way that this man is conducting himself is, you know, pretty much average. He's behaving as he normally would. 
Uh, there's talk of him sitting out in his front yard of an evening, drinking beers, smoking a few cigarettes, going to work as normal. You know, he hasn't fled the scene. He hasn't fled the state. He hasn't done anything, has he? He's basically just carried on as if nothing's happening. The search happens. He spends time with his wife in the car. They must go back indoors. They sleep there that night. He goes off to work the next day. And it's all very much as if nothing has happened. Now, moving on from this issue, just briefly. Recently, we had the Murder Sheet podcast released just yesterday, I believe, talking about how they came across Richard Allen. How did he come back on radar? Or how did they get a tip for Richard Allen? And I couldn't actually believe my ears. I couldn't believe my ears, to be perfectly honest. Basically, what they're saying is that they were looking back through earlier tips and they were reviewing some of the tips or documentation concerning Richard Allen. Now, we've had five years here. Five years. Not five months, not five weeks, not five days. Five years. How has it taken five years to look at look back at some documentation regarding a resident who vaguely resembles the man walking across the bridge. He's a, he's a similar age. He lives very close to the crime scene. There's rumours that he even approached law enforcement after these murders to say he was there that day or close by. I mean, that's just a rumour. I haven't had that confirmed. But if he did, even if he didn't, why has it taken five years to come back around to Richard Allen. Now, maybe I could understand this if this was some tin pot village or something where you had like 10 investigators. But one thing this investigation wasn't short of was manpower. We had the FBI. We had multiple different agencies involved in this case. Yet five years later, we're now going back to take a look at some guy who lives a couple of miles away. I mean, really? I mean, I mean, obviously, this case, to me, is, is, is incredibly interesting. I have absolutely no personal ties to this case. But for the families of the victims, five years. I, I, I just can't quite understand it. Five years. Five years to go back and what? Look at Richard Allen's file? Five years to look back at tips? I mean, surely this is stuff you do in the first five months when you haven't got anywhere when you haven't got any credible leads, when your Ron Logan suggestion has basically gone up in flames, what do you do then? Keegan Klein, you know, we had the Ron Logan thing, didn't we, originally? It was Ron Logan, you know, that the FBI, uh, that, that, that agent believed it was Ron Logan. We had all of that. We, then we had the Keegan Klein angle. And then once those two, you know, once those two suspects are not cleared, but they're, they're, they're not put down as actually physically responsible for the murders, at some point in time, surely you need to go back a little bit. This is a town of a few thousand people. A few thousand people, not, not a million, not tens of thousands. How have they got to Richard Allen five years later? How have they looked at him again five years later when he lives just a stone throw away? A white middle-aged man, someone local, Someone that fits the profile. This is what I can't get my head around. He fits the profile. Why is it five years? Five years to come back to someone who fits the profile. There's something not quite right with this. There's something not quite right, in my mind, with all of this. Now, obviously, at this point in time, nothing is set in stone. Nothing has been verified. So take what I say next with a pinch of salt until we have all of the, all of the details. But... If this does turn out to be the case, that Richard Allen was indeed just an individual on his own who happened to have a chance encounter with those two poor young girls that fateful day. He has no connection to any CSAM ring, no connection whatsoever with Keegan or Tony Klein. If that turns out to be the case, then actually it's pretty disgusting, to be honest. <laughs> we had this press conference just recently, which was, in my mind at least, nothing more than a glorified back patting exercise to thank everybody for their hard work. Um, I'm sorry, five years. Five years to bring to justice someone who's actually been out in the Delphi community, walking free, serving people out in the public. I just cannot get my head around that. If this individual was something different to what we were looking for, to what police thought that they were looking for, 
middle-aged man, someone who was used to walking those trails, a local, someone who knew the area, someone to use law enforcement's own words, was hiding in plain sight. Everything seems to be have, have, have been done in this case completely back to front. Completely back to front. When you retrieve the phone, when you retrieve the phone of Liberty German, what is the first thing that you do? You check who she was in contact with. You speak to her friends. Who was she going to meet that day? Oh, she was going to meet Anthony Schotts at the bridge. Or I spoke to someone who said she was supposed to meet him that day. That's where you start. Keegan Klein should have been the, uh, right at the forefront, all the way through. Ron Logan as well, because yes, he did vaguely also resemble that bridge guy, vaguely. But surely you can move off of that pretty quickly. Once you search his house um, and, and you conduct the, the necessary interviews, you can move on fairly quickly from both of those individuals, particularly if their DNA doesn't match. Do, do they even have DNA at this point? I mean, what do they have? Because now we're told five years later, it's a man who just lives down the road. A man who with a, with a wife, with kids, someone hiding in plain sight. That's taken actually five years to be brought into custody. Something is very wrong here and I can't quite work out what it is. All of this secrecy regarding you know, um, high, you know, keeping the document sealed. If it if it isn't part of something bigger, then what what's what are we doing here exactly? What is going on? If he isn't part of some CSAM ring or part of something larger than what we've been told all along, then what exactly is the reason to keep that document sealed? I just get a, a very strange feeling about this case. Everything seems completely and utterly back to front here. I'm hearing a lot of discussion, and I mean a lot of discussion, regarding Richard Allen putting himself near the crime scene, or being on the trail that day, very near to where both Abigail Williams and Liberty German were found murdered. So did this individual actually insert himself into this police investigation? So let's assume for one moment that this information is factual, that Richard Allen inserts himself into this investigation at a very early stage. What are the possible consequences to the investigation as a whole? Well, if the police are looking at this case, they've discovered the crime scene, they've discovered the bodies of Abigail Williams and Liberty German, the first thing they're going to be doing is looking for witnesses, looking for people who are on the trail that day their initial suspicions are going to be drawn to the people who actually don't come forward. Let's say, for instance, they identify around 50 individuals who are on the trail. If they have, say, thought they can clear 40 of these individuals but have 10 left, naturally the focus is going to be on the individuals who don't come forward to volunteer their presence near to the crime scene. So really, it could have put Richard Allen towards the back of the queue very early on. Now, Richard Allen could have moved even further to the back of the queue if he had a plausible alibi. Now, we don't have any information regarding a, any sort of alibi or where he was or even if he has come forward to insert himself into this investigation. At this stage, we simply do not have that information. But when we compare and contrast this to the behaviour of Ron Logan, now, let me just put this out there. I certainly don't believe that Ron Logan is the killer of these two poor girls. But when we compare and contrast the behaviour of these two individuals, there's a massive stark difference here. If Richard Allen has come forward and said, yep, I was there, I was there between whatever times he said he was, um, he had a plausible reason for being there maybe, and we combine that with Ron Logan's behaviour, an individual who's actually trying to distance himself from the crime scene when the crimes actually took place, then naturally your focus is going to be drawn to that particular individual. What this does not explain, however, is why it has taken almost six years to come full circle back towards Richard Allen. And the reason that I say that is because, quite naturally, we have this video, don't we? We have the video of the man walking across the bridge. Surely FBI would have dedicated quite a lot of resources to this particular video, not just a description in terms of this man's facial features, but you know, they're able to gauge a height from this individual, what he is wearing. This was a small individual, someone who's wearing oversized jeans. I mean, these are the first things that, you, that sort of strike you really about this particular video is the guy's height and his clothing. So really, a lot of resources should have been allocated to this particular video. We're looking for a white individual, most likely someone middle-aged. Yet they've gone completely off of this individual who come forward at a very early stage. Now, all I can think of is that law enforcement had it in their head 
that there's no way that the killer's going to come forward. There's no way that the killer's going to, going to come forward and place himself near the scene of the crime. They must have had that somewhere in their mind. They were looking for someone who was being elusive, someone that was hiding or hiding in plain sight, someone who's not going to be bold enough to come forward and actually put themselves at the scene of the crime when this crime took place. Also regarding the video, we have the voice, don't we? And I remember very early on in this case that we had a lot of heightened discussion regarding what his voice could tell us. It sounds gruff. It sounds like he's a drinker. It sounds like he's a smoker. Look at how he's walking across the bridge. This is someone who's had a drink. Now, I never really bought into all of that sort of stuff because, you know, there's too many variables there. And especially due to the deterioration of the bridge, I always put the walk down to the fact that this guy was walking and his leg turns because he's repositioning, you know, he doesn't want to fall through the bloody bridge, does he? You know, that's that's basically what I put it down to when I view that clip of the man on the bridge. Not so much that he may have had a drink, but if that was such a hot topic of discussion as it was back when this case first originated, you know, has this guy had a drink? Is he a smoker? Then surely at some point in time, those very questions are going to cross the mind of law enforcement. Is that guy on the bridge, is he under the influence? Does his voice tell us anything? Now, we're led to believe, and again, this is speculation here, I haven't had anything confirmed regarding this, but we're led to believe, or there's the possibility, I should say, that Richard Allen checked himself into some kind of rehab facility after these murders took place. Not only do we have a middle-aged white individual who puts himself near the scene of the crime on the day of the murders, potentially, but now we have someone who actually checks himself into a rehab facility shortly after the murders take place. Now, in my mind, the dots are starting to form already here. And you could be less than, what, a month, a week, a few days after the murders. But for whatever reason, they've gone completely off of this guy here. They've gone completely away from Richard Allen. Another one of the more common questions that most people asked when they saw this man walking across the bridge and... We had a discovery of the bodies of these two girls. Is what exactly was this man's plan that day? Was this an abduction that went wrong? Was this an assault that went wrong? Did these two girls try to escape and they were subsequently murdered? Did this individual lose control? Murder was maybe not the first thing on his mind. Now, recently I watched a channel, um, a lady by the name of Pat Brown, who's a criminal profiler. And I think she makes a very, very valid point especially if this individual walking across the bridge is actually Richard Allen. We need to remember here that this guy most, most likely, at least in terms of his facial features, isn't wearing any kind of disguise when he is approaching the girls. He's not wearing a mask. He doesn't appear to be wearing any kind of wig or anything across his face. So this was an individual who most likely had murder on the mind from the very outset. And quite clearly, the reason that I say that is that this individual is approaching these girls and he's not really trying to hide his identity. Now, if this is Richard Allen, someone who lived just two miles from the bridge, then this isn't someone who's going to be letting witnesses go. You know, this isn't someone who's going to be assaulting these girls and letting them go with a full description of who attacked them. So I think she makes a very, very valid point there, that most likely murder was on the mind, that murder was the plan. That was the plan for that day, to take the lives of at least one individual. And, you know, and as I say, that's backed up by how that guy appears, the fact that he's not trying to hide himself. And you might say, well, you we might not have known he was being recorded, but that's, that's completely neither here nor there, because you wouldn't let two witnesses go alive if they had a full description of your face and you lived simply two miles away. You just wouldn't do that. So that gives us a good indication of what his plans were from the very outset. And also, just to tag on to that, this man, Richard Allen, was someone who actually worked in the community. He wasn't a hermit who was hiding in his house 24-7. This was someone who served out in the public and not just worked in a chemist, but actually frequented bars and was out walking around the town. So if this individual that we see in front of us here, if this is in fact Richard Allen, as I just said, most likely the plan all along was to take the lives of at least one individual. Now, the last little piece of information I'm going to share with you today comes in the form of the following photograph. Now, this is Richard Allen's daughter on the bridge in question, the Monon High Bridge. 
Now, a lot of people have taken a look at that photograph and said, Christ, you know, it was uploaded in 2018. This individual's gone back to the crime scene. What a sick individual. He's taken a photograph of his daughter there. Now, from what I've learned online, this photograph was actually taken back in 2012 as part of his daughter's graduation and then uploaded again in 2018. Now, I can't confirm that entirely, but I believe that to be the case, that this, as I say, is a photograph from 2012. But again here, what is taking place in terms of the investigation? A local man, white, middle-aged, someone who resembles the man on the bridge, someone who has knowledge of that area, a photograph of his daughter a few years earlier taken in that very same spot. Something in terms of law enforcement and the way that they looked into this case has gone wrong, I believe, somewhere along the line here. I don't believe it should have taken almost six years for Richard Allen to come back onto law enforcement radar. I'm not just talking about arrest or evidence, but it appears, as I said in a previous video from the Murder Sheet podcast released recently, that this was a case of Richard Allen coming back onto police radar. This wasn't a case of obtaining evidence and keeping a close eye on this individual. This was someone who has come to light again just recently. I think most people, including myself, after this arrest, you know, the initial thought or question was, did this individual have any connection to the Kleins, to either Keegan Klein or Tony Klein? And quite obviously, the Anthony Schott's catfishing profile. Now, the first idea that I have here is that law enforcement wrongly assumed that the Anthony Schott's profile was linked to the murders of Abigail Williams and Liberty German. The reason I say that is pretty obvious. You know, we have the Keegan Klein angle. We've got the Keegan Klein police interview from August 2020. We have the grilling really over that account. You know, the fact that this account actually communicated with Liberty German shortly before her death the thought that there was at least one individual who was using this account. So let's rewind a little bit and just take a look at that angle for one second. They find the creator, the person who admits to using that account, Keegan Klein. They provide him with a DNA test, which he passes by all accounts. So they don't believe that he is actually the killer, but they are still convinced that the killer is actually linked to this particular catfishing account. So could it be from there that they are still fairly convinced that this account has some connection to the murders? So they take a look back at the chat logs, they realise that a few of these words are spelt differently or phrased differently. So they come up with the idea or the theory that there's at least one user of this account. There's multiple users of the Anthony Schott's account. So all we've got to do now is grill Keegan Klein and get this information out of him. Now what I find quite intriguing about Keegan Klein's police interview when asked that question who created the account, who used the Anthony Schott's profile, his response is in complete contrast, actually, to how he answers a lot of his other questions. When asked about the devices, okay, you've got these devices with indecent material on, with CSAM, who else had access to these devices? He would say, well, you know, I lived in Vegas for a little while, my friend had my passcode, he had my PIN number, maybe he used the phone, maybe he was communicating with these people. But when it comes to the Anthony Schott's profile, who had access to this account, Keegan? His response, nobody. Nobody. It's almost like he really doesn't want to even be open to the idea of any alternative users of that Anthony Schott's profile. So let's just revisit very quickly that one piece of the Keegan Klein police interview there where the detective states the following. Let's just focus on that one minute detail, that conversation that happened that went back and forth and again, or refresh your mind, where the girl contacted Anthony Schotts and said, quote, did you hear what happened to Liberty? And Anthony Schotts responded, OMG, what happened? And then she goes and tells him what's happened. And then Anthony Schotts says, well, I was supposed to meet that girl, but she never showed up. So let's focus on that one conversation of evidence we know is true. And it doesn't matter if you remember or not. But who then would have had access? Who would have had access if it wasn't you? He responds, nobody. I'm saying like nobody had access but me. So as I say, clearly there, he's not even offering up an alternative. He's not even saying, well, you know, it could be one of my friends. It could be someone I was living with at the time. He's, he's, he really wants to shut this down, doesn't he? I don't remember the conversation I had. I don't remember any of the content of the conversation. I spoke to loads of different girls. But who else could have used it, Keegan? Nobody. Nobody. 
He doesn't want that to go any further for whatever reason. I mean, that could just be how he's phrasing it, could be how he's feeling in that moment, just wants to shut the conversation down. But as I say, it's in complete contrast to how he's answered other questions where he's been or he's been quite able or open in terms of potentially blaming someone else for his device usage. And then we have the subsequent trip to Vegas where there are searches which take place on his devices for can you trace IP addresses from social media and also searching for server information which I found quite interesting as well. So either this guy is simply concerned because, okay, look, I have spoken to this girl, they're gonna come looking for me at some point, they're gonna question me, I'm gonna be found with all this stuff on my devices potentially. Or the alternative is, as I've covered in other videos, that there is some connection here between this individual, Keegan Klein, and the killer of these two girls. And it may well be that police were on those exact lines in terms of the investigation. They found this account, they found the conversations, they thought, okay, he's passed the DNA test, but we're still convinced that there's some connection here. And maybe they were wrong. So that, in a nutshell, is theory number one. That simply, law enforcement believed that there must be a connection here between one of the last individuals to speak to Liberty, a catfishing account no less, someone who has got CSAM on his devices, someone who's communicating with other male individuals. The killer must be hiding somewhere in this contact list, in this web somewhere. He must be hiding there somewhere. Now, that could be the case. They really did hone in on this, and I can't blame them for that. I can't blame them for that for one second, particularly when we look at the, the more suspicious ser searches conducted by Keegan Klein on his devices. How long does DNA last on a body, etc.? So we can't really fault law enforcement for that. The second theory, which is actually going to blend into a third by the end of this video, is that really what we're looking at is Richard Allen. Richard Allen as a sole individual. Someone who, as told by the Murder Sheet podcast, simply came back onto the radar. He was maybe cleared early on in the investigation, but they decided to look back through some paperwork, through some documentation, and something just cropped up. Something caught the eye of the investigator, and they decided to take a deeper look. And eventually, this basically led to the arrest of Richard Allen, a local Delphi resident. Could it be that there simply is no connection between Keegan Klein, between the Klein accounts, between the conversations on the Anthony Schott's profile to Liberty German? There's no connection whatsoever between that account and Richard Allen. Was it just a stroke of pure misfortune that these two girls were on the bridge that day when Richard Allen came across them? Is that a possibility? Or are we looking at a possible third option here? Now, we've heard a lot of detail passed over by the Murder Sheet podcast over the last few months concerning this case. Backgrounds into Keegan Klein, backgrounds into Tony Klein, backgrounds into basically anyone who's of any importance in this investigation. We've had a lot of very well-founded information, actually, which has turned out to be factual, passed forward by the Murder Sheet podcast over the past few months. Now, all of this information, according to the Murder Sheet podcast, has come from their own confidential source, someone who is close to the investigation. Now, the only way that I can see this being untrue, the only way that I can see this being untrue, that Richard Allen has no connection to the clients when actually he does, is if this information is simply incorrect or they've been fed this information intentionally and I don't mean to create some sort of bloody drama thing out of this please don't take it that way but just hear what I'm about to say next the reason I say that is because we have this sealed document which to a lot of people told us okay there's going to be further arrest this is something bigger there's something bigger out here there's more arrests to be made that's why they don't want to unseal this document that's why they don't want to show their hand because there's more arrests to be made now what better way to I guess move away from that idea, to move away from that idea that more arrests might be made to tip off more people, then to actually throw some information out there that may not be the truth. You know, they're basically saying here that, okay, it was a stroke of luck, really, that we came, across, <laughs> came back across Richard Allen. We were looking back through some old files and, oh, you know, we'll take a closer look at this. What better way to actually put that forward as the truth than to, to announce that on the Murder Sheet podcast? Is it possible that that information is simply not true or it was fed to them intentionally? 
And again, the reason to do that would be to not tip off anybody or to not show their hand in terms of, okay, we've got something bigger going on here, but we want to make it appear that we just stumbled across this. This was more of a stroke of luck. We don't have something bigger in the pipeline. This was just a case of revisiting someone who was on the radar or someone who came forward to law enforcement at a very early stage. Now, as I say, we don't know, do we? At this point in time, we simply do not know. Until that document is unsealed, we can see some of the information potentially, then we're never going to know. It is speculation. It is assumption at this point in time. For me personally, and this is just my own personal opinion here, I still can't believe that there's no connection here between Keegan Klein and Richard Allen. I just cannot believe that. I still feel that there's some connection. I don't believe that the police would have taken almost six years to go back to Richard Allen or to at least revisit this individual. I believe Richard Allen was hidden in the accounts, the accounts which are discussed in the Keegan Klein police interview, as I said in a previous video, potentially the Emily Ann 45 account. For me, I think that has a tie here with Richard Allen. But again, I might be wrong. It's just my own personal opinion. I'm not here to convince anybody. That's just what my own feelings are on that. But anyway, please leave your own thoughts and theories in the comments section below. Do you believe there is a connection with Keegan Klein? Do you believe this is simply a sole individual, that Richard Allen had no connection to the Anthony Schott's profile or the Kleins? So recently we've heard a lot of discussion regarding the individual Richard Allen, someone who by all accounts inserted himself into the Delphi investigation at a very early stage. This individual, however, seemed to be beyond suspicion, someone who perhaps wasn't taken seriously at the time, someone who by all accounts approached a conservation officer shortly after the discovery of the bodies and said, yes, I was there that day. I was on the bridge that day, that afternoon in fact. No, I didn't see the girls, but I was most definitely in the area. Someone who actually matched the description of the man seen in the video in front of you. A short individual, maybe middle-aged, white. Someone who had their hands in their pockets, who didn't seem to be concerned regarding walking over a dangerous bridge with no handrails. Someone who looked like he'd done that before, perhaps. Someone who was familiar with the area, potentially a local man. So how did things go so wrong here? And does this case share some parallels also with a case from this country, the Sower murders and Ian Huntley? So firstly, let's focus on the individual Richard Allen. I've heard a lot of discussion of this being a brazen and confident individual, someone who's maybe even used to manipulating law enforcement. But at this point in time, do we really have enough information to make those kind of assumptions? We've heard talk of this being a potential serial killer. Again, I'm not here to neither confirm nor deny that possibility, but I think we need to look at all avenues here regarding this individual. Could it simply be that Richard Allen was walking across the bridge that day? Maybe he thought that he had been seen by someone, maybe even someone he knew. Maybe it was panic that sent him to law enforcement that day. We don't really know the state of mind, do we, of the individual at that particular moment. We don't know if this was a preconceived idea that I'll commit these murders, I'll hand myself in or I'll, I'll say I was near the crime scene. They won't believe for one second it was me. I'm, you know, I'm a master manipulator. I'll be able to get through any interview that they throw at me. We don't know. We don't know the state of mind of the individual concerned. Now, regarding Richard Allen approaching this conservation officer, by all accounts, he said, yes, I was on the bridge. No, I didn't see the girls. And he was subsequently overlooked or suspicion was taken away from Richard Allen after this point. But what we don't know is if there was any follow-up by law enforcement. We don't know how in-depth that follow-up was. We don't know if Richard Allen had some kind of uncrackable alibi. Did his wife say that she was with him? Did a work colleague or friend say that they were with him during the time that these murders were committed? We don't have that information at this stage. But I think we can all agree that something has gone terribly wrong between the time that Richard Allen came forward to say that he was near the scene of the crime and his subsequent arrest in 2022.
One of the aspects of this investigation which does confuse me, however, is that it seemed in 2019 during the press conference, the press conference held by Doug Carter, that they were on the right track at that stage. This was a local individual, someone who they had maybe interviewed or spoken to members of their family, someone who may be even hiding in plain sight. It seemed at that point in time, they were on the right track. Yet then in 2020, we have the pursuit of Keegan Klein, the, the interview with Keegan Klein. And the interviewers there, the, the detectives, really seem adamant that there's some kind of link between the Anthony Schott's profile, Keegan Klein, and the perpetrator of these murders. So it appears from an outsider looking in, which is exactly what all of us individuals are at this point, it looks like this investigation is very disjointed. There's no congruency here in terms of individuals leading from one to another. It's almost like we've got the killer who's come forward very early on, literally the day of the murders or maybe the day after, we don't know. But he's come forward to law enforcement to say, I was on the bridge that day. He's been overlooked or cleared, whatever you want to call it. They've then moved on to different avenues. Ron Logan, Keegan Klein. But in between that, we have that 2019 press conference where they believe that they've interviewed this guy. It's a local man, someone who knows the area, someone who's hiding in plain sight. Hiding in plain sight. Do you mean, what, two miles away from the bridge? Someone who has actually come forward to you and said that he was there that day? Because to me, you could connect that and say, yes, that's what he was referring to. But from that point in time, we then move on to Keegan Klein, as I say, and the Anthony Schott's profile, and the CSAM ring, and the deeper connections. And now we've gone almost full circle again, and we're back to Richard Allen, the local Delphi resident. For me personally, one of the more interesting words in that Wish TV article regarding Richard Allen coming forward to that conservation officer is the usage of the word unfounded. The report was deemed unfounded. Now, do they mean unfounded in terms of the person who took the report? Was it very brief and just didn't seem right at the time? Or are they talking about the mental health of the person that gave that report? Did they believe that it was someone who was just, as I say, inserting themselves into this investigation for some kind of popularity? Bear in mind that this is a very small community. It's not beyond the realms of possibility for a local person to come forward and insert himself into the spotlight, so to speak. I was there. No, God, no, I didn't see the girls, but I was there. Christ, you know, God, I must have just missed them. You know, that's not beyond the realms of possibility for someone to do that. What I would like to draw your attention to now is a very brief clip of a man by the name of Ian Huntley, someone who also inserted himself into a police investigation someone who was also part of a search party when looking for two missing girls. It was Britain's biggest manhunt ever. Hundreds of police officers and volunteers all focused on the quiet village of Soham in Cambridgeshire. Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman, both aged 10, had vanished on their way to the local sweet shop. Soham College caretaker Ian Huntley apparently the last person to have seen the girls, told the TV cameras he'd noticed nothing unusual. It seemed fine, very cheerful, happy, chatty. Ian Huntley had put himself at the center of the search for Holly and Jessica. But what did his interviews reveal? Our experts watched, listened, and analyzed. I don't know the girls. He starts his sentence with the girls, which sounds a little bit familiar. He realises that and he backs off and says, well, I don't know the girls. Well, the girl, I don't know the girls. Um... So that false start is showing us that he's trying to manage an impression. He's also trying to pose an expression of sadness or concern with his eyebrows. And we know it's a pose because there's a symmetry. The, the, the eyebrows aren't level. His right hand brow is two, three millimetres higher than his left. And this is what happens when you try and fake concern. Genuine sadness is shown with symmetrical eyebrows. How do they seem to you? They seem fine, very cheerful, happy, chatty. 
What we have here is him describing the girls as being happy and chatty, and he's forgotten to take the sad expression off his face is indicator one of deception. Indicator two, he's contradicting these affirmative statements with a slight head shake, no. And in addition, we've got gestural leakage from his shoulder. It's raising a couple of millimeters on his right hand side, which contradicts the positive affirmative statements he's making. That is a strong signal of deception. I seem fine, very cheerful. That's number one. Happy, chatty. That's number two. It's a very slight movement of his right hand shoulder. The raising of the shoulders signal, I don't know. But if I'm saying something affirmative and I want you to believe me, and it leaks from one or other of the shoulders and it's small, then that is a contradiction. His body is questioning that statement. It's a contradiction. So Ian Huntley was also an individual who inserted himself into a police investigation. Someone who was part of the search party looking for the two missing girls. And someone who also went as far as to say he was the last individual to see them before they disappeared. Now to give you a little bit of context regarding Delphi and Soham, maybe a, a comparison if you will. Soham holds around 11,000 residents, so a lot bigger than Delphi. And this case back when it happened was absolutely huge. Absolutely huge in this country. Massive news coverage, massive media attention throughout the country. Up and down the country, everybody was aware of these two missing girls. Now, one monumental difference between this case from the UK and that of the Delphi murders is that police were able to crack this case and even sentence Ian Huntley within two years. This was a case that actually involved a false alibi. Ian Huntley had a false alibi. They managed to crack the alibi. They managed to recover items of clothing and they were onto Ian Huntley at a fairly early stage. I'm just going to read a very small paragraph from Wikipedia which explains this in more detail. Having participated in the search for the children, Huntley regularly asked police officers questions such as how their investigation was progressing and how long DNA evidence could survive before deteriorating. One of these officers observed three vertical scratches on Huntley's left jaw each measuring approximately 3 centimetres, which he claimed had been recently inflicted by his dog. On the 16th of August, 12 days after the children's disappearance, Huntley and Carr were first questioned by police. Now, interestingly, they were on to Ian Huntley at a fairly early stage, as I said earlier. Even when they brought him in for questioning, they still hadn't recovered the bodies or even found the bodies of these two poor girls. Yet in the Delphi murders, we had video of the perpetrator, the voice of the perpetrator, a town that is far smaller than Soham. Soham has 11,000 residents. What is going on here? I don't want to hear this, oh, they had 50,000 tips. They had 70,000 tips. They're not inept. They're not, you know, they haven't done anything wrong. They've just, you know, made a few mistakes. It's, it's unbelievable, actually. It's, it should be classed as unbelievable. A giant cock-up, to use a phrase from this country. How do we have a case here with almost two or three times more people where this crime took place? Two or three times more residents. And within 12 to 13 days, despite even finding the bodies, they're on the trail of the killer. They've got the killer. They, they've got him where they, where they want him, in police custody. And less than two years later... He's sentenced. They've already gone through the trial. Yet almost six years later, we're now just finding out information regarding someone who lived down the road from the bridge. How has this been overlooked? Now, I would wholeheartedly agree that using a term such as inept and phrases such as, you know, there's been failures in this investigation, I would say that that would be fairly harsh if Richard Allen resided on Mars or didn't fit the profile of the man walking across the bridge. They had all of the information in front of their eyes. So how do we not see this as inept? These are professionals. These are people who supposedly dedicate their lives to their profession in order to be the best that they can. Not only that, but they had the best of the best, the FBI working on this case. Yet something somewhere has gone completely awry. 
something is really incredibly wrong, I believe, with this case. And I don't know whether there's, more, there's something deeper going on here. I've got no idea. Hopefully, in time, all will be uncovered. Clearly, there are many parallels to be drawn between the case in Soham and the Delphi murders. And it shouldn't have been beyond consideration that the killer may come forward and insert himself into this case, as was shown in the case concerning Ian Huntley. This is something that does happen from time to time, that perpetrators insert themselves into investigations to find out how that investigation is going, what evidence they have, and really to try and put themselves at the forefront in order to avoid suspicion. The guy in custody, Richard Allen, is he the only person being looked at in this investigation? Uh, right now, he's the one. The, he's the one that's been faced, that that has, that's now facing murder charges. So, again, we are not going to stop looking at other people until this is completely done, and we have nothing left to do. Now, what I pick up upon during his first answer here is that there's quite a lot of stuttering, a lot of stalling, a lot of trying to think about how to phrase his answer, which tells me it's not an easy question to answer in the first place. This isn't simply a yes or no answer, which then leads me on to believe that we're not done yet. We're not done with other individuals who may be charged in connection with these murders. I'm not hearing from Doug Carter here Yes, we've got our man in custody. This has taken a long time, but, you know, the processes that we've gone through, we've got our man and we're going to move forward from here. I'm not hearing that in this answer. It's almost as if it's open-ended. We're not going to stop looking. We're not going to stop taking tips. We're not going to stop looking for other people who may be involved, which tells me there's every possibility here that there are further individuals who will be charged or at least connected to these murders. One of the things that I've heard is why not release the cause of death? Not because people are morbidly curious, but if they knew they were looking for somebody that was either a, a stab or a gunshot, maybe they know somebody that sold the gun, sold the knife. Maybe they could find the weapon somewhere. What's the rationale for not releasing the official cause of death? Because of the individual or individuals that did it, um, only they, they know what they did. Then we move on to some talk regarding releasing the cause of death. Maybe we'd be looking for a knife or a gun. Would that help the investigation? Would that help more tips come in? And his answer, I'm sure, is going to raise a few eyebrows here. Now, the individual or individuals concerned, they know what they did. Now, is Doug Carter here just referring to one individual by saying they... A lot of people are going to say he's using they, that's multiple people. It has to be multiple multiple people because this, he said the word they. But is he just covering all bases here? I wonder what he means when he says that. Individual or individuals. I'm trying to put myself in his position when answering these questions and leaving, I guess, an element of vagueness to my response. And I guess that's what I would say. It, you um, Immediately he says individual and then he says individual, so he's covering both sides, isn't he? He's saying the individual or individuals concerned, they know what they did. The thing that, as I say, that sticks out to me, though, is the fact that he's using the word they. Does that mean there is more than one individual, not just concerned in the case, but maybe even the murder, potentially? Only they, they know what they did. Now, just re-listening to that one more time, the fact that he says they twice to me, is quite telling. Now, some people may say, you know, you're reading too much into it, but the fact that he hasn't said he or the individual, he's saying they twice. They know what they did. If that was just a slip of a tongue, you could understand it being said once. But the fact that he has made a point there, or not even a point, but he said it in a sentence, one sentence, they know what they did. To me, that tells me that there is more than one individual concerned here, at least by what I'm hearing in this particular interview. And I'm trying to think of the, the right way to say this. Has that slowed down the investigation? Because I think the public, with all of their tips, has been a big help in this. Wouldn't it make sense to have the public looking for the possible weapon? I don't think at this point it would. I, again, I, uh, 
functionally, I understand the question, Hammer. I really do understand it. And we're going to look back on this and, and probably realize, dang, I wish we'd have done A, B, and C rather than B and E. And then we have some further discussion regarding the cause of death. Has the fact that you haven't released the cause of death, has that caused some sort of delay in this investigation? We're looking for a gun, we're looking for a knife. Has the fact that you haven't released that information caused a delay? And the response is, is pretty much one of deflection, isn't it? His actual response is, I don't think at this point it would cause a delay. Or I don't think at this point it would. Well, of course it wouldn't at this point because you've made an arrest. You know, there's no, it's no good releasing that information now because you have someone that you've arrested. So it's complete deflection here, the way that this question is actually answered. But then he does say, you know, maybe we'll look back and say um, we could have chosen different options had we been given this opportunity to investigate the case again. So he does answer it in some ways, but his initial response is, as I say, one of deflection. I don't think at this point it would. Well, as I say, of course it wouldn't, because you already have someone who you've arrested. We can't talk about what we think. And I've said this many times yeah. before. We, you should expect us, expect us to only talk about what we know. And that even changes more so uh, once there's a probable cause affidavit signed by a judge for the arresting individual. Not just Richard Allen, but in any criminal case, especially a complex criminal case. This case is unlike any that I've seen in an almost a 40-year career. So there are so many different tentacles to this. It's very, it's, a very, it's very complex. Again, that part there is very interesting, very compelling, very intriguing. He mentions this case being incredibly complex. He mentions that he hasn't seen a case like this in his 40-year career. He mentions there are so many different tentacles to this. Now, what exactly does he mean by those statements, the complexity of it? Does he mean simply that so many tips, it's been such a high profile case, there's been so many tips, so many leads, so many potential suspects? Or does he actually mean there are more individuals concerned in this? This goes deeper. This is a lot more complex than it appears on the surface. He makes the statement that he hasn't seen a case like this in 40 years. Now, when I first heard that, I thought to myself, OK, what he's saying here, the complexity of it, the tentacles of the investigation, he hasn't seen a case like this in 40 years. That's telling me personally, and again, this is just my own personal opinion here, but this is complex. It's deeper. It's larger than what we have just in front of us here, this individual Richard Allen. Now, some people may say, He's talking about just, you know, how high profile this case is. It's unprecedented in this town. Is that what he's referring to there in terms of I haven't seen this in the 40 years that I've been working? This is new to me. Is that what he's trying to get across? Now, some people will say that, but I fall on the other side of the fence here. The fact that he's using such terminology as the tentacles of this investigation, the complexity of it tells me that we're not just looking at one individual who happened to stumble across two young girls. And the way that he uses that phrase there, there are so many tentacles to this, the complexity of the case. Now, when I think of that phrasing, that terminology, that word, tentacles, I think of far-reaching, deep, dark, complex, hidden. That's what I picture when I hear that word personally. So I don't think we're looking at just Richard Allen here, just a sole individual who came across those two girls that day. I just don't see that when listening to this particular interview. And bearing in mind, this is very recent, this radio interview that Doug Carter gave. I hear a investigation that, as I say, is very complex, far-reaching. When I hear the word tentacles, that's literally what I picture, far-reaching, complex, dark, hidden, um, let me know in the comment section below what comes to your mind when you hear that phraseology put forward there by Doug Carter. The other wow. name that's involved in this whole story is Kagan Klein. Now, he has not been charged with anything in regards to the murders of these beautiful young ladies in Delphi. We know that he had some sort of uh, communication with one of the ladies the day before they passed away. Has he been speaking to police has he been given some sort of plea deal to help police we'll continue to work, work on keegan klein and whatever his connectivity might be to abby and libby and and 2100 days ago 
So then we have some interesting discussion, very brief but interesting discussion regarding Keegan Klein. And I think that the way he answers this, the phraseology, the terminology that Doug Carter uses here is very telling. He says, we will continue to work on Keegan Klein. Now, if this was just some mutually beneficial, you know, discussion between law enforcement and Keegan Klein, he's helping them, you know, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. I would have imagined he would have answered that basically like this. We will continue to work with Keegan Klein. But he almost emphasises the word on there. We will continue to work on Keegan Klein. That tells me that they believe that Keegan Klein is fairly integral to this investigation as a whole. I don't think we're looking at Richard Allen here as just, as I said earlier, this sole individual who came across these two girls that day by a stroke of pure chance. The way he's answered that there, we will continue to work on Keegan Klein. It's almost like they're trying to break him down, trying to extract more information regarding his connection to these murders. What do you think the biggest mistake has been? Can you talk about that? Like, I know there's the ongoing investigation, but a couple times today you've said, you know, we're going to learn from this. We've yeah. made mistakes. Yeah. Give me an example. Was, was, the, was the sketch? The two sketches? No, I don't, was that, was, no, I don't okay. think that was a mistake at all. That was a, 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 a frankly, a pretty effective strategy that, that kept information coming our way. Because the second one looked nothing like this guy that's one. into yeah. custody. The first one, you could put a side-by-side -side up with Richard Allen and you could say, I see that. The second one looked nothing like that guy. Yeah, that's something. So now we have some discussion regarding the two sketches. And I find Doug Carter's reply here very intriguing. Now, you, you can just catch it. He basically says, isn't that something? When they talk about the fact that these two sketches don't look anything like each other, Doug Carter's reply is, isn't that something? Now, I've never really bought into all these, you know, these two sketches. You put this piece of paper with this piece of paper and then you'll get someone in between these individuals. For me personally, it, that's always been a load of rubbish. That's like saying you put a drawing of a banana on one side, a drawing of a apple on another side. If you combine the two, you get a kiwi fruit. You know, it's a load of rubbish. It, to me, it's always been a load of rubbish. But this appears to have been a preconceived idea from law enforcement to release this sketch. I mean, we had some guy that looked in their 40s with a beard and another guy that looks like he's just graduated from school. Now... You can't say if you put the two together, you'll get the killer. That's like saying, put these two people together, you'll get a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. It doesn't work like that, does it? And I've, as I say, I've never really bought into this whole idea of, oh, if you combine this one with that one and, you know, shave off the eyebrows, add a bit of hair, you know, put a bit of makeup on the, you know, it doesn't work like that. But it, as I say, it seems to have been a well thought out plan here. That's the way I hear that. You know, isn't that something? almost sort of proud about that second sketch, that it, it kept tips coming in. It also could tell us that we're not just looking for one person. We're looking for multiple individuals here. So let's take a look at the following theory here for one moment. It states the following. The fact there was X amount of time between the murders and when the search started means there is room for one person to murder and flee and perhaps another perpetrator to come to the scene, pose, stage the bodies, take pictures and or souvenirs. So basically what it's saying there is that one individual may have physically committed this crime and someone else linked to this murder or linked to that individual may have reattended at a later time, staged the bodies, took items of clothing, took pictures, etc, etc. Now, on the face of it, when I read that, it does seem very outlandish, very, very hard to believe. I mean, who in their right mind would actually re-attend a crime scene, particularly if they weren't physically involved in the act of killing and either take items of clothing or risk leaving their DNA or even risk being seen heading towards that direction? But let's break this theory down into some smaller sections and see if any of this resonates with anybody. Now, obviously, the information that we have at this point in time is very sparse but what we have been told about the crime scene from detectives is that this was an odd crime scene this crime scene had a lot of unique facts the crime scene itself is very strange physically strange now when I hear those words physically strange what comes into my mind is the potential for maybe multiple footprints we have one individual walking towards the girls on the bridge 
yet maybe there's multiple footprints found at the crime scene, something which indicates that at least one individual has been there or been up to the crime scene. Maybe multiple DNA, multiple fibres from different jumpers, different jackets, for instance. But as I say, when I hear the words physical, physically strange, that tells me that it doesn't match what we're looking at in front of us here. One individual walking towards the girls, two girls found dead across the creek, and whatever they have found there does not match up with what they believe they are looking for. Now, I'm sure there'll be people out there who will hear those words, strange and odd crime scene, and they'll think, well, okay, of course it's strange and odd because the bodies were moved and they were staged. But when you actually listen to the Robert Ives interview, the impression that I get is that the way he vocalises his recollection of that day and the recollection of discovering the bodies and the crime scene, it's almost as if there's a disconnect here. There's a mismatch between what they found and what they should be looking for. Now, when I say what they should be looking for, again, I'm referring to what was recovered on Liberty German's cell phone. One sole individual heading towards the girls, one man's voice on that phone saying, guys, down the hill. Yet maybe, and again, this is just speculation, this is just my own personal viewpoint here, maybe what is found at the crime scene doesn't match what was recovered from the mobile. There is a lot of crime scene evidence. Uh, some of it is somewhat odd. But, but when I say that, any murder scene tends to have odd facts about it. I mean, in real life, obviously, people don't kill people really all that often. And this crime scene, there's a lot of evidence. There's a lot of unique facts there. And honestly, I'm shocked, and I promise you the police are shocked, that it wasn't solved in a day or two because it just didn't seem – we're not used to in rural Indiana. Normally, if person A murders person B, it's obvious who the suspects are, and usually it's pretty obvious how to prove they committed the crime. This – crime is very strange. No, I, I mean, the crime scene was physically strange, but that's for the state police to determine, to decide what to release and not release. I've said that before. It's, it's very odd. For most people, including myself, when you come across these theories online, these suggestions, um, particularly this one, where a, a separate individual may have attended or reattended the crime scene after these murders have been committed, someone who was linked to this killer. You kind of think to yourself, well, that would just be crazy. What, wh why would you do that? What purpose would it serve? Surely it would be far too risky. And it is quite an outlandish theory in itself. But I think really this all, all boils down to the individual on the bridge. At this point in time, we do not know for certain whether this was a lone wolf, someone who just stumbled across the girls that day or seeked two individuals or one individual and decided to commit murder. We don't know if this person acted solely on his own. We don't know whether this was someone who kept all of his illegal and dark secrets hidden from other people or whether he was one individual part of something a little bit bigger. Now, if he does have connections or he did have connections, I think it's worth remembering here that those connections would most likely share similar interests to the killer, similar desires, possibly even similar fantasies. So it isn't beyond the realms of possibility, and I say that loosely, beyond the realms of possibility, that someone connected to that man on the bridge may have reattended at a later date. Yes, it would be risky. Yes, it's incredibly disturbing, but certainly not impossible. Now, my own personal belief, and this is obviously my own personal opinion here, but if anyone went back to the crime scene and it turns out that Richard Allen is indeed the killer of these two girls, then I wouldn't be surprised in the slightest if Richard Allen actually went back to the crime scene. And the reason that I say that is because we've heard a lot of talk regarding Richard Allen coming forward to the conservation officer of kind of inserting himself into the investigation at a very early stage. And I think a lot of people put that down to almost bravado or some kind of preconceived idea, some preconceived plan to get ahead of law enforcement almost. But that may not be the case. It's either one of two things for me. Either this was a preconceived idea that, you know, okay, I'm going to go to this conservation officer, I'm going to um, make some excuses basically for why I was there, you know, get ahead of the game, so to speak. 
That is a possibility. But there is also a huge possibility here that this was just done out of sheer panic. And as I covered in a previous video, it may just be that Richard Allen thought he was seen by someone he recognised in town or someone uh, he caught the eye of someone who he thought he recognised. And it could just be an act of sheer terror. Actually, I'm going to go and say that I was there before they come knocking on my door. This may not be some sort of preconceived plan. Now, if it was out of fear and terror, or panic, I should say, that Richard Allen did go forward or come forward to that conservation officer, then I wouldn't put it past him to re-attend the crime scene before these bodies were discovered. We don't know in what position the girls were found. We don't know how they were staged or moved or anything like that. We have nothing confirmed at this point. But I have heard rumours that the bodies were concealed in some way or they were under some branches or sticks or leaves or it was almost as if the bodies had tried to, tried to be concealed in some way. Now that tells me that there is a possibility that someone could have reattended to try and hide them or move them into a less visible area. And I think what also backs that up a little bit is the fact that we have the Ron Logan you know, search warrant or the Ron Logan document where it, where it mentions there that the bodies were moved and staged. Now some people say, well they were taken away and they were killed and then they were brought back. Now we know that that's not true because there's a large amount of blood found at the crime scene. So where the girls were found is near to where they were killed. They weren't taken away to some shed or some shack and then brought back in the middle hours of, you know, late hours of the morning or whatever. That That's not a possibility because of what is found at the crime scene. A large amount of blood was found at the crime scene. So that should tell us, that should tell everybody that they were killed either exactly where they were found or very close by. And just to clarify there, I'm not talking about the moving of the girls whilst they are alive. I'm talking about where the actual murder took place. It's evident from what was found at the crime scene that the actual murder happened close to where the bodies are found. That's evident by, as I say, the large amount of blood found at the crime scene. What we do know about the crime scene, however, is that both the bodies of Abigail Williams and Liberty German were both moved and staged after they were killed. What we cannot say for certain is when that actually occurred. Now, I would lean on the side that this was done shortly after the murders were committed, but can we really discredit the possibility that someone re-attended the crime scene a few hours later, a couple of hours later, maybe to try and hide the bodies or stage the bodies? I guess we can't discredit that possibility entirely. However, I do feel it is incredibly unlikely. The only way that I could see that being a possibility is if there is some truth in Richard Allen not being so much a master manipulator but actually being incredibly fearful and concerned of being caught when he approached that conservation officer. Was this a case of, oh, I might have left something at the crime scene, maybe I can hide the bodies, I was in a fairly concealed area, if I go back there, there's probably no one there, I won't be seen, maybe I can go back there and hide them under some leaves or twigs or branches. We don't know the thought process of the individual who committed this crime. It begs the question, did something go wrong with the investigation post the 2019 press conference, or was this all connected as part of the bigger picture? The video shows a suspect walking on the bridge. When you see the video, watch the, su watch the person's mannerisms as they walk. Watch the mannerisms as he walks. Do you recognize the mannerisms as being someone that you might know? Remember, he is walking on the former railroad bridge. Because of the deteriorated condition of the bridge, the suspect is not walking naturally due to the spacing between the ties. So very early on in this press conference, we have talk about the man on the bridge. Look closely at his mannerisms. Now, I think Doug Carter, in his mind, had the word subtle mannerisms. He says, look closely at his mannerisms as he walks across the bridge. It's almost as if he was going to say subtle mannerisms, but for some reason stopped himself. But mannerisms, what are they? It's the way in which someone carries himself or the way that they move their head slightly, maybe he bows his head. Is that, is that familiar to you? But for a lot of people listening to this, it would appear quite confusing because on one hand he's saying, look closely at the mannerisms, the way in which this man is walking. But then in the next breath, he's actually saying, 
be careful at looking at the way he's walking because he's walking on a dilapidated railway bridge with spacing between the tyres and that's going to affect the way he's walking and his gait. So, as I say, a little bit confusing. But what strikes me and what sticks out to me is that if these individuals or if this individual's mannerisms and the way in which he walked was so important, then why did law enforcement not go back to people who were actually there that day? Who actually claimed to be there that day. We've got Richard Allen who said he's come forward to the police or to that conservation officer. Why are you not going back and looking at people or at least starting with people who actually claimed that they were there that day? Not just dismissing it as unfounded or, you know, he's probably just trying to insert himself into the investigation for some kind of popularity. Why not go back to these people? If this is such an imperative point or something that's really stuck out to you here, okay, we're looking for someone who walks like this his leg moves like that, or he's got these certain mannerisms, why are they not focusing on the people that they've already spoken to, or at least the people that actually claim to have been there that day, not just claim to have been in the area, but actually put themselves on the bridge. Richard Allen said he actually was on the bridge that day. Why are they not talking to these people, or at least going back and looking at those individuals very closely? During the course of this investigation, we have concluded the first sketch released will become secondary as of today. The result of the new information and intelligence over time leads us to believe the sketch, which you will see shortly, is the person responsible for the murders of these two little girls. And then we move on to discussion regarding the sketches. The original sketch is now going to become secondary and the sketch we're about to show you of the younger individual we believe is responsible for the deaths of Liberty German and Abigail Williams. The age range is 18 to 40. When I go back now and I listen to this, I don't know if this is just an absolute complete crapshoot here I just don't understand it really like there's nothing it just doesn't seem to be anything definitive whatsoever we had the old sketch we had the young sketch we had the Doug Carter interview recently where as I said in a recent video he sounded quite boastful about this new sketch you know when the interviewer said to him but it doesn't look anything like Richard Anne or it, or it didn't look anything like the original sketch and then Doug Carter replied with isn't that something almost as if Yes, okay, releasing that sketch brought in more tips. Um, it opened or widened the investigation further, and eventually we landed on Richard Allen. But in this press conference, they're saying that they believe that this individual is responsible for the deaths of Liberty German and Abigail Williams. But this guy looks about 18. He hasn't even got facial hair. doesn't even look old enough to have facial hair, to be perfectly honest. Now, the more that we go into this press conference the more I start to believe that actually, as I said earlier, this was just throwing darts in the dark, really. 18 to 40 in terms of an age range. One sketch that looks like someone who's 40 to 50. One sketch that looks like it's someone 18 to, I don't know, maybe 22. Very strange. Very, very odd. We also believe this person is from Delphi. Currently or has previously lived here, visits Delphi on a regular basis, or works here. We believe this person is currently between the age range of 18 and 40, but might appear younger than his true age. We also have some talk here of this being a local resident, a Delphi resident, someone who either lives in Delphi or visits Delphi on a regular basis. Now, this isn't just some stroke of, you know, pure genius here. I mean, this is probably one of the most obvious factors in this case. The fact that this guy is walking across this bridge with his hands in his pockets as if he's done this 10 times before should tell us that this is an individual who is local. It's someone who has been on this bridge before. That is, that's the impression you get when you see that video. This isn't, this isn't just someone who has stumbled across the moan on high bridge whilst driving past. This is someone who has walked that bridge previously. So the fact that they're talking about, um, you know, a local Delphi resident, which albeit does resonate with what we know at this stage regarding Richard Allen, that's probably one of the most glaring and obvious, obvious factors 
in this case, even back in 2019, even back when they recovered the video, that should have been fairly evident. That they're most likely, and you obviously you can't discount other possibilities, but the most likely scenario here is that we're looking for someone who lives in the local area, the local community. Dir directly to the killer who may be in this room. We believe you are hiding in plain sight. For more than two years, you never thought we would shift gears to a different investigative strategy, but we have. We likely have interviewed you or someone close to you. We know that this is about power to you. And you want to know what we know. And one day, you will. A question to you. What will those closest to you think of when they find out that you brutally murdered two little girls? Two children. Only a coward would do such a thing. We are confident that you have told someone what you have done. Or at the very least, they know because of how different you are since the murders. Now we move on to discussion regarding a change of strategy, switching of gears, moving in a different direction. And I think we need to remember that from this point, they then move on to Keegan Klein. Now, a lot of people will say, well, this is just a glaring mistake and they've now ended up back at Richard Allen. But the truth of the matter is, at this point in time, we just don't know, do we? We don't know if they did head off in the wrong direction and they ended up full circle back to Richard Allen. But we also equally don't know whether there is some connection here between Keegan Klein and Richard Allen, which I believe is the most favourable option at this point. And as I say, at this stage in November 2022, we don't know for certain if there is a connection between Keegan Klein and Richard Allen. There is every possibility here, at least in my mind, that police did go off in terms of the direction of Keegan Klein, and that eventually led them to Richard Allen. They may have had to have gone through Keegan Klein to get to Richard Allen. Interestingly, as a side note, I saw quite an interesting video yesterday regarding some of the phone usage, the account usage of the Anthony Schotts account and the fact that the police would have had to have, you know, requested details from certain service providers, etc. But what I feel that that creator missed when talking about that, he basically said, look, there can't be a connection here between Richard Allen and Keegan Klein because during the Keegan Klein interview, they didn't say to him at any stage, look, we've got your phone logging in from this address in Delphi. Who is this individual? Who is Richard Allen? And what I feel that everyone should be wary of is overestimating what the police actually know at a certain stage. And what I mean by that is that we don't know if Richard Allen was very well versed in hiding his online persona or his online identity. It isn't always just as easy as, you know, recovering these apps, recovering messages and linking them to a certain IP address. Many people who are into this kind of CSAM stuff, or maybe they're members of forums or websites, whatever, on the darknet, a lot of these individuals are incredibly well versed in hiding their identity. Why do you think that there are so many of these individuals out there that are never caught? Because it is difficult. It is difficult sometimes to peel the mask back and find out who these individuals are. It isn't just a case of, okay, this person sent a message. You know, they could hide their IP. They could then have um, email accounts they've created through the darknet. There's various, various ways in which they can distance themselves from their actual physical address. So believe me, it's not that easy just to say, okay, this person sent a message, who is Richard Allen? Um, we've got a login here from Richard Allen's address. For, for all we know, Richard Allen, if there is some connection here, and again, I use that word, if there is some connection between Richard Allen and Keegan Klein, we don't know what capability he had, as I say, in terms of hiding his online presence. Now, this particular part of the press conference has always stuck out to me. The fact that they clearly say here, 
what will those closest to you think of when they realise that you're responsible for these murders, for this heinous crime against these two young girls, basically? Now, that tells me that they're not looking for some kind of loner, some kind of transient individual who has no friends, no connections, you know, a hermit. We're not looking for that type of individual here. We're looking for someone, as they say, hiding in plain sight, someone who has or leads a fairly normal life, has connections, friends, family, maybe even work colleagues, workmates, people who he socialises with. He has people that maybe depend on him, but certainly he has emotional connections or family ties. This isn't a sole loner individual that they're talking about here. And again, that is reflected on what we know at this stage in terms of Richard Allen. So as I say, with this press conference, a lot of it does appear to be quite scattered in terms of the two different sketches, one individual looking like he's in his 40s, late 40s, maybe even in his early 50s, and another individual who looks like he's around 18 to 22 years of age. We also have that age range put out here in the press conference that they're looking for someone between the ages of 18 and 40. Obviously, very widespread, very ambiguous, not really pinpointing anyone in particular with that information that they gave out. But then we move on to stuff which, as I say, resonates with more that in terms of what we're looking at at this point in time, in the present time, with Richard Allen, a family man, a local Delphi resident, someone who has connections, people that, as I said earlier, people that maybe even depend on him, people that are going to be incredibly shocked when this individual is finally brought to justice. And that is reflected in Richard Allen. So that does make a lot of sense. So could it have been that they were on the right track back in 2019, but it actually took going to Keegan Klein putting or joining all the dots together to eventually come round to Richard Allen. Anyway, do leave your own thoughts, theories and feelings in the comment section below regarding this particular police press conference. What track do you believe that they were on during this time period? Did something go wrong during the investigation which led them away from what they believed they were looking for in 2019? Or was this all part of the bigger picture? Delphi murder suspect Richard Allen remains in custody after a judge in Indiana put off his bail hearing until next year and will mull over the decision to unseal the arrest affidavit as the mother of one of his alleged victims begs for it to remain sealed. Allen, 50, was given court-appointed lawyers after sending a handwritten letter to the court asking for representation last week. His lawyers have since filed a request for Allen to be released without posting bond or by setting a reasonable bail amount, which will be considered on February the 17th at a bail hearing. Allen is accused of murdering both Libby German, 14, and her friend Abigail Williams, 13, as they hiked a trail in Delphi, Indiana in February 2017. He has pleaded not guilty to both counts of murder, and prosecutors have sealed his arrest warrant from being accessed by the public. As part of Allen's petition to be let out on bail, his attorneys say, quote, because neither the proof of guilt is evident nor the presumption of guilt strong, the accused is seeking a hearing to release the accused. Carroll County prosecutors requested that the court records be sealed, with special judge Francis Gold deciding to delay her decision on if it should be handed over to the public during a 30-minute hearing on Tuesday. Fox News 59 confirmed that no one else was named during the court hearing as being linked to the case. The probable cause, affidavit and charging information will remain under seal until Judge Goal makes her decision, as the mother of Libby has begged for it to remain under wraps. Okay, so at this point in time it would appear that the affidavit will remain sealed. Now it doesn't mean it's going to remain sealed forever, it just means that the judge, Francis Goal, is going to take her time, take that document away and make a decision at a later date. Now, interestingly here, we have quite conflicting views online regarding this affidavit and what it actually contains. Now, I've speculated in previous videos of mine that I believe that there is, there's definitely a deeper connection here. Keegan Klein, possibly other individuals, some kind of ring, other people involved in the murders of Abigail Williams and Liberty German. Maybe not physically involved in the murders, but at least had knowledge of them. But online we have, as I say, quite conflicting views. We have one reporter who came out after this hearing to say that 
he believed that there's other people involved or potentially other people involved. This is why the affidavit is going to remain sealed for the time being. But then looking at Max Lewis, who works for Fox 59, I believe, he spoke to Richard Allen's attorney and it states the following here. Richard Allen's attorney on revelation in court today that second person possibly involved in Delphi murders. His reply was, quote, if you read the probable cause affidavit, it does not mention anything about any other person. That was news to us. We also have some discussion from Barbara McDonald, who was inside the courtroom this morning, and she discussed Richard Allen's behaviour during this hearing. She stated the following. Richard Allen made eye contact with several members of the victim's families, according to Barbara McDonald. Barbara McDonald was sitting with several family members. Richard Allen made eye contact for several seconds, scanned the rows the family members were sitting. He took in the environment and scanned the room a lot, rather than keeping his head down. He didn't say a single word during today's proceedings. Interestingly, we also have the following here. The defence attorneys say that they and Richard Allen want these documents public. Prosecutors provided the judge with a redacted version to consider releasing. Okay, so then we've got this affidavit. The prosecutors have provided the judge with a redacted version. The defence attorneys and Richard Allen want these documents public. Now, we've heard from the defence attorney very briefly who said there's no mention of any other parties in this affidavit. The evidence doesn't appear to be very strong now. Obviously, when you read that, first of all, you think, well, of course, that's what the defence is going to say. But if there was something really glaringly obvious, you know, some massive smoking gun here, would they be really that keen to release that information out into the public? Would they? I mean, that's a question I'm asking myself. Defence attorneys say that they and Richard Allen want these documents public. So the prosecution doesn't want it made public, yet the defence and Richard Allen actually do. Now, equally, you could say that this document is going to be released at some point in time, and this is simply the defence maybe appearing more confident than what they actually are, trying to get ahead of the game, if you will. Maybe they want to you know, appear confident and that they've got all the answers to what is in this probable cause affidavit. But it's interesting there that they mentioned, or his defence attorney mentioned, that there's only one name. It's only Richard Allen that appears in this affidavit, which makes me question everything that I've believed, really, for the last few weeks regarding there being multiple people involved, some kind of ring, the possible Keegan Klein angle reappearing... I do wonder what is in that document and why they are keeping it sealed. We've got, as I say, the judge who's received a redacted version of this. Are we going to see this maybe in the next few days, the next few weeks? Or is it going to remain unsealed, possibly even for the months to come? If, however, there is only one name in this affidavit, or it only points to one individual in Richard Allen, then where exactly does this leave Keegan Klein and his involvement? if any, in these murders. Now, I'll just put it out there, and I'll be quite honest. I am going from one side to the other in this case. Initially, before, even before the arrest, to be perfectly honest, I was, I was really convinced that there is at least one individual concerned in these murders, that there's something a little bit bigger going on, and that's why, it, that's why it has taken so long to make any arrests, because they're tracking certain people down, they're putting all the pieces of the puzzle together, so to speak, and then when we had the arrest of Richard Allen just recently, and then we had these, these, these articles that were released that said, basically, we came across Richard Allen. He was someone that came forward to law enforcement at a very early stage. And we, you know, we had a task force that went back over old tips. And we, you know, something didn't appear right. So we looked into it. And, oh, here we go. You know, he's been under our nose the whole entire time. Just this one individual lived local, local individual, as we said all along. And, yeah, he's responsible for these murders. I went from believing that this is some sort of deep level situation to actually swaying a little bit, thinking, hang on a minute, maybe it is just one individual, a lone wolf. This person just happened to come across Liberty German and Abigail Williams that day and murdered them. But then I swayed back and I thought about this a little bit more. I thought, actually, no, hang on, let's go back to the Keegan Klein interview. There's definitely something in here, this connection, the uh, Emily Ann account all of his connections via Dropbox, the sharing of links, the CSAM ring. There has to be something bigger here. 
Let's now take a listen in to a reporter who was actually in the courtroom for this hearing earlier this morning. Well, good morning. It was a hearing before Judge Fran Gall out of Allen County, the special judge assigned to hear this case. It lasted just a half hour. We left the courtroom just minutes ago. Richard Allen was brought into the courtroom. He was in a yellow jail jumpsuit. He was heavily trussed up with chains covered over a Kevlar jacket. He was brought into the courtroom. His family sat right in front of me in the courtroom. He did make eye contact with them. The prosecutor for Carroll County, Nicholas McClellan, stood and requested that the judge continue the sealed uh, probable cause that was filed on October 28th during a behind closed doors initial hearing. McClellan argued in front of the judge that he used words chaos. He pointed to the courtroom, the abundance of the media there, and also the security there, and said this is the reason why we need to secure and keep this probable cause secret. He said two reasons. One, because uh, we fear that witnesses in the case will be harassed by the media or be put in danger. But most significantly, he said, we believe Richard Allen is not the only person involved in this case. He continued to make his argument with the judge. Then it was the opportunity of the defense attorney, uh, Bradley Rossi, who defends um, Richard Allen. And he was able to uh, argue counter to that. He says, we have actually seen that unredacted probable cause. We don't think that there is absolutely anything in there that shows not only to the guilt of our client, but also he indicated that we have seen no evidence that there is any sort of uh, danger to any member of the public. Nobody has said, come forward and said, I've been harassed unfairly, danger to the public. And he also said, I see no indication that there's any other involvement uh, in this case. The judge has determined uh, upon taking all that information in that she has set a hearing for mid-February when this issue uh, not only the well the bail issue will be brought up because his defense attorneys yesterday filed uh, that he be released on bail the judge says she will hear arguments on February 17th about whether or not to release Richard Allen on bail however regarding whether or not to release the redacted or unredacted probable cause the judge has received a redacted version from the prosecutor with names of witnesses blacked out she says i will take this under consideration i will then give you a written advisement on my opinion of this at this time we're not going to receive that probable cause today the judge has instead received it from the prosecutor with names blacked out she will take a look at that to determine if that is a reasonable way to uh, undergo and keep the, the public fully informed as to the details of this case. One of the arguments that the defense made said, we have seen nothing but press conferences for five years from investigators from the state police asking people to tune in, asking people to come forward with tips, and now that we've got a, a charges against my client, against Richard Allen in this case, all of a sudden the prosecutor wants to shut down all public input into this investigation. And the hearing, as I said, lasted just a half hour. Richard Allen was taken out of the courtroom, and then the rest of us were released from that courtroom. Russ, I wanted you to catch your breath for a minute, and I want to just make sure that I heard you correctly, because this is the one thing that people have been waiting to hear for a very long time. I, I understand you to say that one of the reasons the prosecutor wants this to be sealed is that they believe that Richard Allen is not the only person involved. Can you clarify that and then dig deeper a little bit in that? It was a brief statement then from the prosecutor because frankly he spent most of his time being concerned about the media coverage. That involved most of his argument. However, he did say that we believe Richard Allen is not the only person involved in this case. And that was one of the two justifications he used to say the investigation continues. We cannot jeopardize the continuing investigation by releasing the probable cause at this point in time with some of the information uh, that would be revealed and therefore would hamper um, the investigation. Now, he issued uh, four exhibits that he used to support his position that the probable cause remains sealed. Two of them were from investigators who said because of all the work we've done on this, we believe there is sensitive information here. We don't want this released to the public. Another one is a letter from Becky Patty. Of course, she is Libby German's grandmother. Said she didn't want that information out. And also 
the attorney referenced an online petition which he said had the prosecutor said there was an online petition which had gathered 40,000 signatures which showed there was widespread support for continuing the seal on this probable cause. We're just watching some live video of the van that brought Richard Allen to the courthouse, just leaving the courthouse right now. How long do you expect the judge in this case to look over that redacted probable cause and release it? The judge took the redacted probable cause in hand during the uh, briefing, during the hearing this morning. She said she was going to issue a written advisement on it. Uh, she said she was not entering it as an exhibit, so it would not become necessarily part of the public file, but rather taking it under advisement for her review privately. Uh, if this is Tuesday, conceivably she could decide within 24 hours. We do have a holiday week this week. She may want to get this off her desk. Uh, before the uh, holiday, which then goes Thursday and Friday, and of course there would be uh, no court opportunities to take a look at that. She could uh, do it that quickly, uh, and it was interesting that the prosecutor came to court prepared with that instead of being directed by the judge to provide a redacted copy. He came to court with that redacted copy, giving everyone an idea that he had an idea of what would have been required to release that information and to uh, get the judge's uh, approval. That's a couple more questions here. I wanted to go back over who was in the courtroom again. Was any family member of Richard Allen? Um, I think you briefly uh, touched on that off the top, but I wanted to hear a little bit more specifics about that, specifically his daughter or his wife. Well, there were two older women who were sitting right in front of me in the courtroom that were uh, shown to special seats, secluded, set aside for them. I would say there were at least a couple dozen members of the victims' families. The rest of the courtroom was filled out uh, basically by the media. It was also ringed by easily a 10 to a dozen uh, police officers, uh, including state troopers and Carroll County Sheriff's deputies. Uh, and an attorney representing uh, Indianapolis news media was also on hand. He filed a brief yesterday indicating that it would be appropriate to release this information publicly. However, while his brief was accepted, uh, he was not called upon to offer any argument or testimony before the judge. Okay, I, we had a producer in our ear right there, I apologize, but did you say that they did not get to hear from the attorney from the other side on why it should be released? The judge did not hear from the attorney representing the Indianapolis news media. Yes. Instead, there was a brief filed, but he did not, uh, was not offered an opportunity to testify or offer an argument, and we are hoping to interview attorney Dan Byron outside the courthouse here this morning. So recently, concerning the Delphi murders, we had the prosecutor who came forward with the following quote. We believe Richard Allen is not the only actor involved in this. Now, immediately upon hearing those words, I guess I'm thinking in the back of my mind, OK, that's exactly what I've been saying. That's what we've been talking about recently regarding multiple individuals, some kind of CSAM ring, at least multiple individuals having knowledge of who committed this crime. That all seems to make a lot of sense. But in this video, we're going to turn the tables a little bit and we're going to look at this from a different perspective. Now, recently we had Doug Carter on a radio interview who said the following, unsealing the court documents wouldn't hurt the integrity of the investigation. So Doug Carter didn't seem too concerned with this affidavit being unsealed, with the contents of that being made public. And then we also had the rather curious quote from the defence of Richard Allen, who blatantly said, we don't see anybody else named in that affidavit in terms of an investigation or people they're looking into, so I'm quite surprised by that. They're basically saying that the only person of any real interest in that affidavit in terms of the police investigation is Richard Allen. So anyone secondary to that is basically news to them. It's a shock to them. They are not aware of that. And bearing in mind those individuals have actually seen this document. So my opinion of what this affidavit contains is that it contains pretty much what the defence are saying here. It's basically solely focused upon Richard Allen. But I believe that the police have another card up their sleeve here, so to speak. I think that they're going to question Richard Allen, not just about these murders, but about other people's potential involvement. I seriously don't believe for one minute that the police believe that Richard Allen was this sole individual who killed these two girls 
and this is the only person we're looking for, the only person who will be sentenced for these crimes. The way that I read that there, we believe Richard Allen is not the only actor involved in this. They're not using the word perpetrator, are they? They're using the word actor. When I hear the word actor, I'm conjuring up ideas of people in the background, maybe, associates, not someone who is physically responsible for the act of murder. Now, when we start to put the pieces that we do have of this very complex puzzle together, and bearing in mind we don't even have a quarter of them, I wouldn't say at this stage, but when we put the pieces of the puzzle together that we do have, to me that does make a lot of logical sense. On one hand, the case is still active. It's an ongoing investigation. They're still looking for tips. They're still pleading and asking people to call in with any information or any tips they may have. They also say that Richard Allen is not the only actor involved in the murders. But then on the other hand, we get told the complete opposite in a lot of ways, that Richard Allen is the only name listed in that affidavit in terms of police interest. And that's, I guess, echoed in a lot of ways by Doug Carter with unsealing the court documents wouldn't hurt the integrity of the investigation. When he says that, I'm hearing, okay, there's no other names of people that may be in that affidavit who haven't been arrested, who haven't been questioned, who haven't been cleared or brought to justice by law enforcement. There's no other names that they need to be concerned about. No other names they need to be concerned about getting out into the public domain. And for me personally, when you hear law enforcement and the prosecution really giving every ounce of suggestion that they possibly can, that this case is not finished. This isn't a done deal. A lot of people will just simply think that this is okay, they're following due process, they're going through the stages of this investigation. Of course, it's not finished, they haven't gone to court, there hasn't been a trial. But then when you get statements like, we believe Richard Allen is not the only actor involved in this, then surely that tells us that they need to question this individual, that they're interested in what Richard Allen has to say. Not so much the work that they've done thus far, in terms of putting together the probable cause affidavit, etc, etc, but they believe wholeheartedly that this case just doesn't end with Richard Allen. Now, taking a look at another quotation from Richard Allen's lawyer here, which states the following. You're going to read the probable cause affidavit online or wherever they get it, and hopefully that's going to ring a bell for somebody to help us out. So I find that quite interesting there. Hopefully that's going to ring a bell for somebody and help us out. Does that mean that law enforcement were able to somehow break down Richard Allen's alibi? Because you would imagine that as this individual came forward to the police at a very early stage, he would have at least had some kind of alibi for the afternoon when these murders actually took place. Are the defence hoping here by saying words like, we're hoping that someone will come forward and help us out, it will ring some bells for somebody and they'll come forward and help us out, do they mean that they're hoping that someone will say, oh yeah, you know, I saw Richard Allen cutting his grass at three o'clock or four o'clock or whenever. Are they hoping it's going to bring someone forward to validate Richard Allen's original alibi? Because it appears what's happened here, and what I would imagine does actually appear in the affidavit, is the breaking down of that alibi, or they managed to work out and prove, basically, that Richard Allen's original alibi was false. Now let's take a look at a post from, by all accounts, a defence lawyer. Now, this isn't someone who is working for Richard Allen or someone who is directly involved in the case, but he has shared his thoughts here, which I do find quite interesting. He states the following. Here's my current theory. Prosecutors have evidence that Richard Allen is involved in the murders, but the evidence may not be so strong as to really show he's directly responsible. I think they likely found evidence that directly links him to the homicides, a weapon, a piece of clothing, something like that, but that doesn't necessarily show he's the killer. Presumably, based on the statements today, prosecutors also have info that someone else was involved. Why is that? Because saying someone else was involved is a risk since it provides a concession Richard Allen will use as a defence to point the finger elsewhere. Unless they really believed it for some reason, they have no incentive to say that in court. 
Okay, so I'll just cut in here very briefly. So this really just backs up what I said at the start of this video. I really don't believe that law enforcement think that this starts and ends with Richard Allen. I'm not really buying into this whole idea that they just stumbled across him a few weeks ago and then the ball started rolling and he was subsequently arrested. I just don't really buy into that. It doesn't seem right. There's something missing there, particularly with what's been said out in the public, the fact that they're looking for other people potentially, or they're at least keeping their options open and the investigation is still ongoing at this stage. So to me, that makes a lot of sense what he's saying there. By them, by them actually saying that, we believe there's other individuals concerned. There's every likelihood that Richard Allen could in fact turn around and say, well, yeah, of course, it's him, blah, 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 you know, for X, Y, and Z reasons. He could have a lot of reasons why someone else was involved and not himself, pass the blame onto someone else, so to speak. So in a way, what he's saying there is correct. It is a risk for the prosecutors to say, we're not sure, or we believe, I should say, that other individuals are involved here. It kind of takes the sole focus away from Richard Allen and kind of spreads it to other individuals, which isn't really the ideal thing you want if you're trying to convict a sole individual of double murder. So let's continue on with the last part of his post here, which states the following, which leaves us with the evidence so far. My guess is that it's enough to bring an indictment for felony murder based on circumstantial evidence but that its lack of strength also gives Richard Allen's attorneys the ability to argue the direct evidence he was the killer is slim. It seems clear Richard Allen committed a crime, either by obstructing justice or aiding and abetting the real killer or other CSAM charges. So I think the prosecutors threw the book at him because they need his help identifying other parties involved that day. They will continue building out a case using his cell phone and electronics data, DNA, etc. If they have to go to trial, they will, but I think they want info from him. So what are my thoughts on the last part of his post here and this theory overall? Now, I think we need to be wary that we are dealing with defence attorneys here. We're looking at people who are paid to do a certain job and they do that job to the very best of their ability. Their job in this case is to defend Richard Allen. What I don't believe the defence would lie about, however, is the fact that the only name connected to the murders in this affidavit is Richard Allen. I don't see them lying about that. So if we take that as a truthful statement for one moment, and when we get our hands eventually on this affidavit, and let's just say, for instance, it does turn out that Richard Allen is the only name in that document, then how do we rationalise what has been spoken about by the prosecution? That there are other individuals here. This case is ongoing. Richard Allen was not the only actor involved in this. To me, that does make a lot of sense what this guy is saying here. That they need to extract information from Richard Allen. They want to hear about his connections, who he knows. Maybe they, maybe they know for a fact that there's other individuals connected here. But law enforcement do not know who these individuals are at this stage. Maybe the only credible lead they have is Richard Allen. As I say, all will be revealed in good time when the affidavit is eventually unsealed, redacted or unredacted, whatever they do end up releasing. But as I say, I think there's a strong possibility here that Richard Allen is the only name and that further connections will emanate from this individual. Is that to say that he isn't the man on the bridge or he isn't physically responsible? No, of course it isn't. But the police, have, as they have already said in their own words, they are not stopping until everything has been done. All stones have been unturned or overturned, whatever you want to call it. They will not stop until every avenue has been explored in this case. If there are other people who assisted Richard Allen, if there are other individuals who knew who committed these murders, or had prior knowledge that they were about to take place, those individuals will be tracked down. And it could be that law enforcement at this stage only know of Richard Allen, of his physical involvement in the murders. Anyway, please leave your own thoughts and theories in the comments section below. I'll be sure to check those out. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do so by clicking the subscribe button below. And as always, many thanks for joining me for this video. I look forward to seeing you all again for the next one. Take care. Cheers.